I'm Joey Tedesco, and you're watching the Cartoon Palooza. After Cars, most fans of Pixar were left disappointed. It was a film with lazily written characters whose story didn't measure up to the likes of their previous work. However, I can safely say after watching it is that it ain't the worst Pixar movie out there. Now I'm sure with the talent they got on board, they're not going to resort to dull storylines and hoping surface value is going to be enough to make an entertaining movie. Hold my drink. Right. Cause two, everybody. My existence relies on your tears. I've held off watching this film for a long time due to its reputation. I know a lot of people had bad vibes about this film before, during, and years after it was released. It only seems right to discuss it in relation to the first film, especially since I'm looking at the Cars franchise this month. Like I've said in previous videos, the Cars franchise has driven an interesting journey, having had its highs and lows. This unfortunately is a pretty big low you can't tell yourself out of, as I'll discuss in this video. Like this for starters, did this movie really need to exist? On paper, it makes sense. The movie brings in a lot of money in merchandising. It'd only be a bonehead decision for Pixar to pass off an opportunity to help bring in more revenue that can go into better quality films. <laughs> Remember folks, every time he farts, he's literally farting out a new character to your favorite animated film. <laughs> Look at that, he literally farted out anger. Story-wise, like many who have complained before me, it doesn't make much sense to have a Cars 2. The movie seemed to take a happy ending where our characters discover what they want out of life. Not to mention three of the supporting cast members have passed away, including one who passed away during the first film's production. Like I mentioned in the first film's review, the characters don't really go beyond being common stereotypes. Look at their designs, and that's all you need to know about them. They don't really bring anything new to the table, or make you engage in the story with the exception of the Hudson Hornet character, played by Paul Newman. To basically prove this point, the Radiator Springs characters only occasionally say a line or two and then pushed off into the background should a joke or gag require their service. You know the movie's desperate when their main character from the first film isn't even a main character. You see the poster with Lightning McQueen on it? Yeah, don't get confused, he's only gonna have a side story in this one. You wanna know where the real meat of the story is? This dummy. Because if kids and adults want someone to relate to, it's the dim-witted character who spends most of the film bumbling his way through silly antics and getting our friends in trouble. The whole reason there's a conflict in the film is because some Italian race car claims to be the fastest car in the world. Mater Smack talks him into getting Lightning McQueen involved into a Grand Prix race with him. I don't know much about this type of racing, but is that even legal? It don't help when every time he's embarrassing Lightning, making him look bad, we're expected to feel bad for him when he messes things up. Now, if you want us to feel bad for him, show a struggle. Most of the time he's on screen smiling, giggling, or making a stupid joke or observation. So when he's in trouble, or we're expected to feel bad for him, it don't make sense, since it don't really seem like it phases him. What I find funny about this character in this film is that they try to give him a new character trait. Despite being a complete idiot who doesn't know how to spell kissing, He's like a super expert in knowing cars. A Volkswagen Common Gear has no radiator. Well, of course it doesn't. That's because it's air cooled. <sighs> the reason behind this is that when he's confused for a spy, the actual secret agents assume his dumb antics are part of a cover when he's occasionally saying something insightful about the cars they're trying to find. See how he's had most of his parts replaced? And see all them boxes over there? Them's all original parts. They ain't easy to come by. Now, I find it funny how in the film, the secret agents have no idea about the cars they're trying to find. And it's Larry the Cable Guy of all people, who knows more about them despite confusing Wasabi for ice cream. Well, I guess that means I should get into the spy aspect of the film because a slice of life story about a race car on a self-discovery journey has so much to do with secret agents and espionage. I mean, they just go hand in hand, don't they? Now, when a neat throwback to James Bond and Ashton Martin, played by Michael Caine, assumes Mater's a secret agent where the actual secret agent places a tracker on him. Along with the added car intelligence trait they gave Mater, Michael Caine has him complete missions all while he hangs out with Lightning McQueen competing in the Grand Prix. You know, the actual story to the film. You'd think it'd be cool for Pixar to make a spy film, especially since this is a genre they barely touched on. A little bit in The Incredibles, but not so much. But here's the thing, when they do have a spy angle in this film, a lot of the things they focus on have either been dated or been done to death. 
Spy movies used to deal with cool gadgets and over-the-top villains. In the 60s to late 90s. Movies like Taken, Jason Bourne, and the current James Bond films focus more on hand-to-hand -hand combat, shaky cam, and motives that are more relatable than silly masterminds trying to take over the world. Now, it would be interesting to see an animated film relate to these current spy trends than the older ones we've seen done to death and have even become a joke at this point. On top of the fact if you're gonna have hand-to-hand -hand combat, hands, you need them. I always ask the question of how cars are able to do anything when they don't have appendages or grab or hold things. Now, you bet I was asking myself this question way too many times in this film. Can cars really jump or do kung fu? They only move one of two directions, forwards and reverse. Now that's intended for hair raising actions. I can go forwards and backwards and I can do it again and maybe even make a turn. What's funny about the spy aspect is that we're expected to follow a mystery. Thank you, Mel. It is very, very good to be here. It's him. They're barely covering it up. Literally, you could see the square outline. The scheme is not only nonsensical, but does raise a lot of questions. In the film, we got a billionaire who supplies an organic fuel that don't rely on refined oil. However, he uses it to sabotage the races into switching back to oil, which he works with a group of lemon cars who own the largest oil refinery in the world. Now, what's a lemon, you may ask? Lemons are cars that easily break down and have been called back from production. So wait, you got a movie where there are characters that are discriminated against and they don't have a fair chance in the world. This is an interesting aspect that could add a lot to the movie. I wonder how many times they talk about it. Two. Two times. Why wasn't the movie about them? Can you imagine how great it would have been to have a Cars movie focus on this? Give it another level or meeting? Well, I guess not, since we spend most of the film watching Larry the Cable Guy bumble his way through shenanigans. In short, skip it. This don't even play a big role in the Cars franchise, as I'll talk about with Cars 3. If you're looking for surface enjoyment, you ain't gonna find it here. Most of the visuals have a pretty standard look or feel that doesn't really give any of the characters other than seeing real world locations and car jokes. The only aspect I can give to this film is John Turturro playing an Italian race car. He may be a stereotype, but Totoro really gives this character an edge that I wouldn't mind seeing him in another movie. He's snarky, playful, unknowingly full of himself. I enjoyed most scenes he was in, which wasn't too many. And that means it wasn't a whole lot of enjoyment out of this film. So, were you one of the poor unfortunate souls that saw Cars 2? Comment below and let me know. It's always a pleasure making these reviews. Feel free to subscribe to the channel, like the video, do all that fun stuff. I'm Joey Tedesco and thanks for watching this review on the Cartoon Palooza.